from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's a great privilege for me to be here today to introduce one of the finest writers on the staff of the Washington Post, Will Haygood. What distinguishes Will, as those of you who have read his newspaper writing or his several, several excellent biographies will know, is his exquisite sense of history and his pitch-perfect ear for dialect. He's brilliant at describing the unsubtle tectonics of race in our land, and he's possessed of a wise, empathetic voice that subordinates itself to the narrative. His writing never overpowers the extraordinary tales that Will likes to tell of other people's remarkable lives. Yet Will's own life story is one for our times, too. He's a child of Columbus, Ohio, where he was a self-described product of a simple boyhood overlaid by a complicated family, a story he told in a memoir, The Haygoods of Columbus, a love story. He didn't set out to be a writer. In fact, he majored in city planning during the 1970s, which those of you old enough to remember will recall that was when the New York Daily News ran the headline, Ford to City Drop Dead. New York may not have taken the hint, but Will did. He switched over and took a management training program at a big department store, from which he was soon fired. He jokes he was reading books in the stockroom, which may have been good training for what came next. He figured if he couldn't make it in retail, he could always try journalism. It was a good fit. He worked, his worked for the Charleston, West Virginia Gazette, the Boston Globe, and for the last 20 years or so for the Post, where he's now on our national staff. One of his unique talents is describing the lives that are the threads in the tapestry of our times. Some, like Sammy Davis Jr. and Adam Clayton Powell Jr., are famous. Others are less so. Three days after President Obama's inauguration, Will wrote a memorable profile of Eugene Allen, a black man, as Will put it, unknown to the headlines, who had, who had never in all his years serving as a White House butler imagined he would see someone who looked like him in the White House. The book Will will talk about today is Sweet Thunder, his biography of Sugar Ray Robinson, the boxer and cultural icon and owner of a famous pink Cadillac that I will let Will explain if he wishes. Please join me in welcoming Will to the National Book Festival. Thank you and welcome and uh, certainly uh, on a day like this, uh, I know that uh, the executive editor of the Washington Post has a million and one things he could be doing, so I'm quite touched that uh, he took time to come out here to introduce me. Um, somebody just asked me a few minutes ago if I grew up fighting in a gym, boxing. And I've been trying to tell ladies from the second grade on that, that I consider myself much more of a lover than a fighter. <laughs> but there was one experience I had in the boxing ring in my hometown in Columbus, Ohio. I was in the sixth grade, and somebody talked me into stepping into the boxing ring. I might make the team if I was fast enough in the ring. And the other person hit me very hard, and I went down. And the pain went in one ear, down my back, down the back of my leg, over to the other side of my body, and I'm still feeling that pain today. So no, I never became a boxer. But I had a lot of admiration for somebody who had a life as fascinating outside of the ring as they did inside of the ring. And while this book is a book about a fighter, Sugar Ray Robinson, it really is much more. It's a, what I like to think, it, it's about, as Langston Hughes put it, the sweet flypaper of life. Sugar Ray Robinson had three very dear friends in Harlem. They were Langston Hughes, Lena Horne, and Miles Davis. And a lot of this book is about the wonderful cultural swirl that Sugar Ray Robinson made happen. A lot of the nightclubs in New York City in the 30s and 40s, as you know, were segregated. And so Sugar Ray Robinson took it upon himself with his earnings from the ring to build a nightclub, it was called Sugar Ray's. 
And it was very elegant and folk could come, all races, all youths, they could come and sit down and not worry about the color of their skin. And that in turn proved to the wonderful jazz giants, Duke Ellington, Sammy Davis Jr., who was an entertainer, and others that Sugar Ray's was the place to be in Harlem. I went on a book tour, and I'm just going to tell you about two things that happened that stand out a great deal and made me know that the five years I spent on this book were well worth it. Uh, I was interviewing somebody, and they said, you have to go find Mel Dick. And I said, who is Mel Dick? And this person said, well, Mel Dick knew Sugar Ray Robinson for many, many, many years, more than 35 years, and he's someplace in Florida, and you must find Mel Dick. It's going to add a lot to this story that you're trying to tell. And so I was able to track Mel Dick down in Miami, Florida, and this is Mel Dick's story. When he was eight years old, he lived in Brooklyn, New York. He played hooky from school. He went into New York City to a gym, Steelman's Gym, where Sugar Ray Robinson happened to be sparring. Now, Mel Dick is white, and he told me this story when I found him, and he was the lone white kid in the gym that day, just sitting in the audience watching Sugar Ray Robinson spar. He played hooky from school and he didn't tell his mom and dad where he was going. Sugar Ray Robinson noticed him out, out of the corner of his eye and after he was finished sparring, he walked down and he was talking to the other people and he bent down and asked Mel Dick who he was. And he said, sir, my name is Melvin Dick. And, and he said, uh, why are you here? And where's your mom and dad? And he said, well, my mom and dad, they're at home and they, and they do not know that I'm here. And Sugar Ray Robinson said, well, why are you here? For heaven's sake, why are you here? And he looked up at Sugar Ray Robinson and he said, because you're my hero and I love you. And for the next 45 years, Mel Dick and Sugar Ray Robinson were extremely, extremely close. Sugar Ray Robinson was the best man at Mel Dick's wedding. Mel Dick was there along with Miles Davis in 1965 when Sugar Ray Robinson at the age of 40 plus fought his last uh, bout. And uh, it was just a beautiful moment and to find somebody from their youth on up who had known Sugar Ray Robinson. And the second great moment for me as a writer happened in Ailey, Georgia, and that's where Sugar Ray Robinson was born, although he was only there for a few months and then his family took him up north in Michigan and then from Michigan to Harlem. And I went to Atlanta, Georgia on the book tour to give a reading and the Atlanta officials took me the next morning to Ailey, Georgia, a little small rural community. Uh, and I'm thinking as we're driving over that, goodness, it might not be anybody there for the simple fact that Sugar Ray Robinson had left when he was four months old. And we drive and we roll into this little tiny town and a little library on the side of the road and they had a marquee and on the marquee it said Ailey Georgia welcomes Will Haygood. Uh, that may be the only time in my life that my name will be on a marquee. I appreciated it though. Now there were there were about 125 people in the lot next to this little 
library, just milling about, men and women, mostly men and women, and they were milling about. And my thinking is that, gee, something must be going on at the library. Uh, I wonder what it is. And I got out of the car and I was in a suit. If you're gonna write a book about Sugar Ray Robinson, you have to go out and buy some nice suits for the simple fact that Sugar Ray Robinson was a very elegant guy, dressed very beautifully, wore a pink Cadillac. I mean, drove a pink Cadillac. Uh, it, was a, uh, it was an era of lushness. His life was, uh, was an era of just true elegance and grace and lots of poetry. But anyway, a man in the parking lot walks over to me and he has a very deep Southern voice. And he says to me, would you by any chance be the author? And I said, well, yes, sir, I am, I am. And he said, wonderful. He said, we're all Sugar Ray Robinson's relatives and we have come out to walk you into the library. And I was so, so very touched. It was just wonderful. And when I got into the library, you know, I was, I was just so enormously touched. I started reading and there were about 130 seats. So it really was me and Sugar Ray Robinson's family and I would read certain sections and they would yell back at me, that's right, sugar, hit him, sugar, amen, Lord have mercy, that's my sugar. That boy was something else and I'm reading, I'm looking up at him, I, it's really, oh wow, hey, amen, Lord, hit him, sugar. So you know, those two experiences were, were, were worth, were worth being away, uh, you know, on your little book advance that you get, you know, hoping that your editor is going to welcome you back into the newsroom after after the several years of uh, you know of hard work on the book. But uh, but it has been worth it in every uh, every sense of the word. This is the final book of what I like to think of as a, um, a trio of books about unheralded or lost figures, you might say, in history. There was Adam Clayton Powell, there was Sammy Davis Jr. and Sugar Ray Robinson. They're all figures uh, who I think uh, uh, put a little more of the red, white, and blue in this country and uh, made a uh, unique difference. Uh, so. Thank you, and uh, I guess we'll open it up for some questions. I was curious, uh, how many uh, women played a serious, significant role in his life? In uh, Sugar Ray Robinson's life? Yeah. Uh, yes, his mother, uh, Layla Walker, uh, was a very, um, uh, fierce lady. Um, Sugar Ray Robinson uh, used to go outside uh, when he was a kid, eight, nine years old, and he would get beat up and he would be crying and he would go home. And his mother would say, don't come in here crying. Go back outside and fight. So in a real sense, uh, his mother sort of shoved him into the fight game. I think Sugar Ray Robinson, if he would have had uh, his druthers, would have been an entertainer. He actually left boxing for three years and, and became a uh, hoofer, a dancer. He wasn't very good at it, and then in 1954, he went back to fighting. But his mother was uh, you know, very important in his, uh, his psyche. Were, were there a lot of women attracted to him, uh, oh, you, pursuing oh, him? Uh, oh, <laughs> ladies, ladies. You're talking about the ladies in the nightclubs. Okay, I was a little slow on that one. Okay, uh, <laughs> you know, as with all flamboyant figures, uh, and as Raymond Chandler once put it, there's always a lady. And in Sugar Ray Robinson's life, you know, 
And I think that there were a lot of women around, although he only had two marriages, uh, and uh, he died married to his second wife, Millie, out in Los Angeles. So, okay, I'll go over here. First of all, thank you very much for the book. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank I you. too uh, idolized Sugar Ray Robinson when I was a kid. I still can't believe he lost to Joey Maxim. But I wondered if you could compare his cultural impact with Muhammad Ali's. Mm -hmm. Well, now, I mean, great question. I think uh, one of the main reasons why Sugar Ray Robinson somewhat got lost in history was that another fighter who fought in the 1960 Olympics in Rome, he came along. And the TV age was just starting to explode, you might say. And Ali really, really sort of wiped Sugar Ray Robinson from, from a, lot of, uh, a lot of our not memory, but a lot of our uh, visual love. Sugar Ray Robinson should have been on those night, night talk shows like, you know, or the daytime talk shows like Merv Griffin or Phil Donahue or whatever you had in the 60s and 70s. But then you had this huge figure, a cultural bullet across our airwaves, Ali. And in a way, Sugar Ray Robinson receded. He moved to LA uh, and uh, he started a youth foundation, which, is, uh, which was just wonderful because in his youth foundation, the kids could do a lot. They could dance, they could play the piano, badminton, checkers, they could paint, but there was no boxing. There was no boxing. Sugar Ray Robinson did not want to have a child get into a boxing match and go home and not have a father open the door and tell the son that everything's going to be all right because Sugar Ray Robinson's father was not under his roof. And so that's very telling. And actually, that was one of the reasons that made me want to really write this book. Sugar Ray Robinson was a fighter. We founded a youth program, and you could do anything you wanted to almost in that program except box. Okay, I'll go over here. Okay, hi. Uh, two questions. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe you've implicitly answered it in terms of the, the physical toll of boxing. Uh, we know football players have serious problems when they get banged on the head, and we've seen some horrendous consequences of boxing. So I wanted to ask what Sugar Ray thought about all that. And if I could veer to uh, Sammy Davis Jr. and your, your other book, um, what real depth of knowledge did he have of Judaism? He converted, and that was always talked about. But I, I wonder what it really meant to him in terms of his knowledge and his commitment. OK. Um, that question um, is you know, it's just a big layered, layered question, and there's not enough time in the answer it. But you'll find the answer in a book called In Black and White, The Life of Sammy Davis Jr. Okay. okay. Your first question about boxing. Yeah. Sugar Ray Robinson, I think, foresaw all of this, that boxing was a very brutal sport. In 1947, he went to Cleveland, Ohio. He fought a guy named Jimmy Doyle. Jimmy Doyle had suffered some uh, severe knockouts in the state of California. He shouldn't have been boxing in the state of Ohio, but he was allowed to box. This was in 1947. Sugar Ray hit him with a punch in the chin, and it killed him. Uh, Sugar Ray was threatened with arrest and a charge of manslaughter in 1947. Uh, and so he knew that boxing took an a, a, took a, a awful toll on fighters. But he lived in America. It was segregated at the time. There was no jobs on Wall Street. 
for blacks, no jobs in banks, few, few, few jobs in Hollywood. And so boxing was one way where a black man could and become uh, somewhat, somewhat wealthy. And so Joe Lewis, Henry Armstrong, other fighters, they took that risk knowing that. Now, now, I might add that after Sugar Ray Robinson killed Doyle, he took a tour and fought four times and raised money because Doyle was fighting to buy his mother a house. And Sugar Ray was struck to the core that Jimmy Doyle died fighting to buy his mom a house. So Sugar Ray Robinson went and fought four fighters, they were, and they were tough fighters, but he gave his winnings to Jimmy Doyle's mother so that she could buy her house. I just think it's a very touching, uh, touching part of his life, his history. Thank you. Go over here. Hi, Mr. Haggard. Hi. I liked your point about uh, three of the uh, kind of forgotten people in American history. I just finished a uh, master's thesis at Georgetown University on Nathan Hale, oh. one of the, I think, uh, forgotten heroes of American uh, history. Yes. My question is, I don't know if it's been asked, but who gave Sugar Ray his name? Where did that come from? Okay, yeah. great question. Uh, he was born Walker Smith, Jr. Walker Smith, Jr. I think that the ladies liked Sugar Ray Robinson a little more than Walker Smith, Jr. But anyway, uh, he was a young fighter on, on, a, on a, um, a young boxing team uh, based in a church in Harlem. Uh, and they went into Watertown, New York uh, to fight. Uh, he was just 15 years old. And there was a fighter on the team named Ray Robinson. But Ray Robinson got sick. And so young Walker asked the manager George Gainford, if he could go on, if he could fight in Ray Robinson's, his place. George Gainford didn't think he was good enough, but the young Walker Smith browbeating in the locker room said, coach, please let me fight, please, I'm ready. Walker Smith fights, but George Gainford, the manager has to change the name on the fight card. He has to, he doesn't have an extra fight card, so he uses the fight card that said Ray Robinson. And he told the referee that the kid stepping into the ring now is Ray Robinson. So he fought and he knocked the other kid out. I mean, boom, boom, boom. His skill was apparent even then. There was a sports editor named Jack, Jack Case from the Watertown newspaper. Jack Case asked the manager, Gainford, who is that fighter? And because he sure is sweet. And he said, well, his name is Ray Robinson. When Jack Case hustles back into the newsroom, he makes up the name Sugar, Swedish Sugar. So he makes up in the name. Sugar Ray Robinson scores knockout at arena. And the name stuck. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Hi. At uh, one time, um, professional boxers were really at the core of um, the American consciousness. They were the real cultural icons. Uh, Joe Lewis, Sugar Ray Robinson, Muhammad Ali. I have to admit, I haven't a clue who the heavyweight boxing champion is today. What, what has happened that, that there's no longer Sugar Ray Robinsons, or at least Sugar Ray Robinsons coming out of boxing? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that in the 40s, in the 50s, boxing was like um, NCAA football is now. It was epic. There were fights fought outdoors. There were stadiums that were, you know, full of people, 100,000 people. They were fought at night. It was stunning to see two figures in a ring. Radio was big. The rivalries were big. Joe Lewis, Max Schmeling, Jake LaMotta, Sugar Ray Robinson. Uh, 
these figures were sort of larger than life. And I think because of the simple fact that we have more sports now that are seen by more people. And the fight game has suffered so much as far as integrity, honor, uh, 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 it's just really suffered something that it hasn't been able to come back from. And thus, we really don't follow fighters the way we used to follow fighters in the, in the 50s, in the 60s. And I mean, that was one reason why I wanted to spend years unraveling Sugar Ray Robinson's life. He was a big, big deal in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and yet, he sort of vanished. And I just think that we found other sports and to watch. Uh, and, you know, so many, so many comically and tragic things have happened with fighters, heavyweight fighters, especially over the past 15 years that it's hard to sometimes take it seriously. Okay, I'll go over here. Hi, Mr. Haygood. Hi. Um, just first of all, I want to say congratulations to you for uh, being nominated for the 2010 Hurston Wright Award for nonfiction for your book and also for the... Thank you. Also for being nominated, or being a runner-up, rather, for the Penn ESPN Award for Sports Writing. Thank you very Thank much. You. I really Thank enjoyed you. the book. I'm a writer, so I'm going to ask a writer question. Okay. Um, all of your uh, biographies, they're so nuanced and they're so layered and you give us so many things about so many people in Sweet Thunder. We found out not only about Sugar Ray Robinson, but we also found out about Lena Horne, Miles Davis. I mean, you were able to put so much into it. How do you keep all those thousands of bits of information flowing to be able to make it really coherent and inviting for the reader? First question. Second question is, what are you working on now? Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. She said some wonderful things that I swear I hope that all the people back in the fifth grade who said I would never amount to anything, I hope they heard that. I hope they're watching C-SPAN today and I hope that they heard that. As, anyway, these figures. And it's interesting uh, when I wanted to, you know, like have Lena Horne and Miles Davis and Langston Hughes swirling throughout the narrative, my editor, Peter Gathers, wondered if it would work. Uh, and I said, well, let me write the first 50 pages and I think you'll see what I'm trying to do. And, you, you know, they all were of the same um, time periods. You know, and they all, you know, sort of flourished and worked in Harlem. And so that made it easier. Uh, but I did have a wall in my home and up on the wall, it would say something like Sugar Ray Robinson, 1947. And then I would have a big piece of uh, wallpaper and it would ask me, I would write the question, what is Lena doing in 1947? And then under that, I would ask the question, where is Miles Davis at in 1947? And then I would say, where is Langston Hughes at in 1947? And then, you know, it skips ahead, and then I bring the reader up to what Langston and Lena and Miles are doing, say, in 1953. You know, and so I knew that every, every 50 pages or so, I wanted to remind the reader that there's this wonderful cultural swirl going on. It really is a book about um, all the things going on outside of the boxing ring. Uh, you know, if you think it's only a book about violence and blood and boxing, uh, it, uh, it is not. Uh, it really is a book about 
about poetry, about music, about dance, about nightlife, about nightclubs, about New York City, about Los Angeles, about Chicago. Uh, uh, it's a book about America and how she danced and sang with these people in the middle of the spokes wheel. Okay, question over here. Sort of can't hear, something's wrong. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, there yeah. we go. I'm a big fan, thank you. You always gift us with your words. I have a quick question, thank you. Uh, which is just, how do you choose your subjects for a biography? Adam Clayton Powell, you know, Sugar Ray Robinson, Sammy Davis Jr. Just wondering what is it that uh, uh, a, a figure would have to possess to get, to get Will Haygood to take on their lives? And then I will cede uh, the rest of my time to the gentlewoman from North Carolina. Um, I, and my quick question is, why did you become a journalist, and how has that training affected the books that you've written, um, like the Sugar Ray Robinson book? Okay, thank you. Uh, last questions over here. Uh, in the first one, uh, how did I choose the, uh, the uh, subjects? Uh, real quick answer. Um, New York Congressman Adam Clayton Powell was, uh, you know, a force on the Hill. Uh, he went to Congress in 1944 and uh, left in 1970. Uh, um, he was big on the uh, student loan program, and uh, I would not have gone to college were it not for the student loan program. And so, in the back of my mind, I just said to myself one day many years ago. I simply wanted to pay a debt back to, uh, to Adam Clayton Powell, and you know it really was a dream as simple as that. And so that's how that book was uh, was birthed. Uh, Sammy Davis Jr. When I was little, growing up in the '60s, there were not very many blacks on TV, and Sammy Davis Jr. was one of those figures who was my mother and my grandmother who raised me. They would call me in the house and say, Sammy Davis Jr. is on TV, Sammy Davis Jr. is on TV. And so he meant something to them, and so I just sort of told myself it'd be interesting in to write a book about Sammy Davis Jr. someday. These are figures who happen to have had a lot of scandal in their lives, and they were sort of a burden with scandal, and yet there was something heroic about Adam Clayton Powell, Sammy Davis Jr., and Sugar Ray Robinson. I told you at the beginning about the punch that I took that I'm still filling. So I wrote this book to figure out where that punch came from. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.